Thank you for joining us. Um, Keith, I'm going to do a quick tech check. Am I, is everything okay? Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm Janet Walsh, and I'm a senior fellow at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. And today I have the honor of kicking off this webinar. It features students and alumni of our Master of Human Rights program, and it's a joint program between the Humphrey School and the College of Liberal Arts. As you'll see today, our students and graduates are active champions of human rights and social justice. They're putting their passion and their skills to work here in the Twin Cities and around the world. Today, they'll share their reflections about the importance of human rights at this transformative time and what they're doing to promote rights, justice, and equality. I'll briefly introduce our panelists today and they'll tell you more about themselves. We have as our moderator, Yolanda Burkhart, and our speakers are Sarah Alice, Paul Olubayo, Nikuli Shangwe, and Raven Ziegler. I wanna give a special shout out to Bailey Sutter and Vanessa Mercado Diaz for helping organize this panel. And for Vanessa, uh, to Vanessa for moderating and, and monitoring the chat today. I learn a ton from these students and I know you will too. So over to you, Yolanda. Hi everyone, good afternoon. And thank you again for joining us today. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Janet. My name is Yolanda Burkhart. I am a second year Master of Human Rights student and I'll be serving as the moderator today. Um, so before we jump in introductions, just wanted to set some expectations for the next hour. Uh, first thing we'll do is we'll take a few moments for each panelist to briefly introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their background and their focus issue area with human rights. Um, next, we'll kick off the conversation. We've got a few initial questions that will draw out the panelists um, for what they're working on now, strategies, approaches. Uh, and then for the last 10 to 15 minutes, we'll open up the discussion to give you an opportunity to ask questions. And we'll ask Vanessa to come on and uh, share the questions that have been populating in the Q&A. So throughout the next 45 minutes, feel free to just add your questions there and we'll read them at the end. Um, and yeah, so that's my last reminder is just make sure to put your questions in the chat box. Great, thank you. Okay, so with that, we'll start with introductions. Um, and we're gonna start with Sarah. Hey all, my name's Sarah Alice. Um, I'm originally from Michigan, but moved here back in 2013 to start a job. Ended up finding the MHR program in 2016 when it started and have stuck with it ever since. Um, hi, I'm Nikuli Onokululego Shangwe. I am a second year Master of Human Rights student at Humphrey. Um, I, I'm from all over the place, South Africa. I lived in Ohio for a while before settling in Minnesota. I came here originally for AmeriCorps Vista at the organization that I now work for full time, Nexus Community Partners. And during my work there, doing some work around cooperatives and economics, really found an interest in uh, looking at the human rights expert, uh, aspect in economic justice and what that means for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, good morning to you all from where I am. Uh, my name is Alamaraju Paul Olabaya. Um, I'm a graduate of the Master of Human Rights Program, graduating in the class of um, 2020. Um, I'm originally from Milton Keynes in England. Um, I stumbled upon the program in, my, um, in a vigorous Google search when I became um, wholly apathetic to my legal degree in the United Kingdom. Um, I moved out here in 2018 and um, join the program and my focus is on um, international justice and human rights law. Hi everyone, um, my name is Raven Ziegler. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Lower Rural Sioux Tribe. Um, I am a recent graduate of the Master of, Hu Master of Human Rights program at the Humphrey School, where I focused on business and human rights. I have done work in the past with Amnesty International, and yep, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much it. I'm not sure what else to say about myself.
Vanessa, do you also want to introduce yourself? I think she's been having some connection issues this morning. Vanessa, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Vanessa Mercado Diaz. I am a now current second year at the Master of Human Rights um, here at the Humphrey. I am focusing on Latin America, migration, and women's rights. Um, currently, I am uh, interning with the Advocates for Human Rights here in Minneapolis uh, within the Women's Division. Um, and I'm continuing on through the fall with that, as well as um, being a GA research assistant uh, with the uh, Center for Women, Gender, and Public Policy. Great. Thanks, everyone, for introducing themselves. Um, and with that, we'll jump into the first question. So given that you all are or were graduate students in the heart of Minneapolis, um, in, in the heart of the Minneapolis uprisings after the murder of George Floyd, how have you been involved with the community or the movements? And this can be, this include a wide range of things from policies implemented at the local or national level. Um, I can start. Um, so um, after the murder of George Floyd, I think we were all and still are devastated and on uh, like uh, trying to deal with trauma in our different ways and so when that after that happened uh i was involved in some of the protests later on but then decided that uh my skills and needs were met were better for but i could help out in a different way so i um i assisted with a mutual aid site that, that started here in midway st paul near the griggs building because um a lot of the businesses had closed um in the corridor and there were no spaces for communities to, to gather like resources needed from like diapers food etc so that's where I was involved. And later, as things were kind of slowing down and rebuilding, really being involved through my organization at tables that are thinking about what it looks like to rebuild and what that looks like when we really center community. Because unfortunately, we may um, see some outside forces coming in that really want to displace and further harm our communities. So what can we do in order to get in front of that? And lastly, I've been really involved with an initiative that was started by Black Visions Collective um, after receiving donations from all over the world, where they are currently working to refund $3.1 million back to community. So at the organization, we are currently working on a regranting strategy between now and December where we can get funds to people. And um, yeah, just as a way to continue to figure out or rebuild or heal from this moment. So I have lived in South Minneapolis for the past seven-ish years um, and was about 10 blocks away from where the third precinct uprising first started. Um, and whenever this, whenever the movement started at first, I was very concerned about the accessibility to resources and basic necessities for folks that live in South Minneapolis and particularly the indigenous community. Um, so my community was, and, and South Minneapolis generally, was really good about organizing locally uh, to create mutual aid um, initiatives. So I was not only involved in uh, the redistribution and collection of donations um, for the mutual aid purposes, but also helping fund um, community-based alternatives to law enforcement where local community patrols were out on the streets basically every day and every night, um, AIM and Little Earth patrollers protecting Southside indigenous communities. Um, and from that, I also realized that it was important for us to consider our human rights degree and what it looks like for us to implement these unique skills that we've acquired. So I started an initiative with about six other people from the program where we were, we are in the process of doing a research project on the state of human rights and state violence in Minneapolis. Um, 
we're on the second phase of our project right now where we will begin conducting interviews with people who have been affected um, by state violence and we hope to have a report published by next year. So as a white person, this was always a little bit awkward, especially because I feel like we need to let the community speak for themselves and raise the voices of people of color who have been affected. So also just because I am more the type of person to stay in the background anyways, I found it much easier to donate supplies, to donate money to these groups, some of which Nikuli did mention. Um, and I've also been part of the group that Raven mentioned, the research group, and trying to use some of my data um, expertise that I've gained through the program to contribute to the project and um, add more of that data analytics to the final product. Yeah, and I think um, for me, in my position, it was very hard. Um, I, I, just as um, George Floyd's murder happened, I just relocated out of the Twin Cities. But obviously, naturally, I'd been there for two years. It had been a city that showed me so much love and light, and I had a, just a deep um, connection to the city. So when I woke up on the morning of May 26th, and I saw that video across my social media feed, I was on, honestly, I was stunned into stillness. Um, I didn't know what to do. And I'm Raven and I interned in DC together um, last summer. And Raven knows I'm the type of person who I'll happily go to a protest, I'll stand on the front lines, I'll talk to people, I'll listen. I was in a position where I was in a completely different state, completely different time zone, so I felt disconnected from the protest. Um, where I currently am right now, I'm in a household with an infant, and in the midst of this current pandemic, it wasn't safe nor smart for me to be going out to a protest. So I was stunned into stillness for about five days. Um, following the George Floyd's murder because one, I was so shocked, but two, I, the, the typical way I process, the typical way I advocate, I couldn't do it um, in this pandemic. And so I had to find new ways. And um, it wasn't until maybe towards the end of that week where um, Vanessa, who's, who's moderating today, you know, spoke up in our Master of Human Rights Facebook group and said, listen guys, we're human rights students and we need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to be active and forefront at this injustice that happened in our community. And as soon as she said those words, it sparked me into action. And it reminded me that there are other ways to advocate, there are other ways to go about it. Um, I had the luxury, as I said, being from the United Kingdom, um, this, this issue, being from the United Kingdom, someone who was in Minneapolis, naturally I had a lot of people reach out to me and say, one, how are you? One, and two, are you safe? But three, how has this affected you? What can we learn from this? How can we help? And so I naturally grasped onto the transnational aspect of what was going on in this movement. I, I, I helped and I listened and I supported protests that were going on in the United Kingdom. Um, I was reached out to by professors on my undergraduate university, Keele University. I was reached out to by professors on my high school um, who, who communicated with me and asked how they could be of service, how they could further this movement. And so I took to doing what I feel like I do best, which is speak and write. Um, I wrote pieces online just expressing my raw emotions, my raw feelings about where we were, um, where we needed to go, and what changes needed to happen. Um, and for me, that was what, what we call the education phase of human rights, educating the populace, letting people know what's going on, um, letting them know what needs to change, and letting them know how it needs to change. Um, on top of that, I've had the pleasure of being a part of um, the, the study group that Raven mentioned, um, and the research group, and, and we're looking to go forward and conduct those interviews to have real systemic policy change. And then, you know, I've been able to, with the help and support of many of the people in this chat and many of our other human rights um, students, you know, been able to begin, just begin, not go too far, but begin advocacy within the Humphrey School and the College of Liberal Arts into making sure that our institutions are really committed long term to this fight for racial justice, racial equality and racial equity. Um, so that's how I've been involved um, thus far. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to transition to something similar. And as we were prepping for this panel, Nikuli actually shared something that was really um, important for us all to keep in mind, which is that there's a lot of momentum right now for racial justice and evaluating our systems. But how are we going to keep moving forward and keep the advocacy going beyond this moment? Um, and so I want to turn it over to you guys to 
talk to our audience about like what we should be doing or how you think this should be moving forward or things to keep in mind this movement Yeah, um, I think a lot of the things that were said um, by my peers kind of ring true to this, like really taking cue from community. Community, don't, community knows what they want, community knows what they need. Um, and we have an incredibly diverse community here in the Twin Cities. And I mean, also worldwide, it's just being, it's just being connected to community and under, understanding who to go to and what to look for. Um, but I also think on a larger aspect, it is really about figuring out like what our institutions are doing, specifically like our school at Humphrey, right? What are we doing with our curriculum? What are we doing? Who are we hiring, et cetera? Because we want to make, this is not, this is, this, this moment, it will not end today. It'll not end by the end of this coming semester. It's a lifelong journey, right? We're trying to undo policies that have existed since the beginning. Well, since this country was taken over uh, by colonizers, right? So trying to figure out like how we can undo some of those uh, traumatic practices that have been put in place that really continue to harm and further marginalize already marginalized communities. I would just add on to that. Um, I think what's important not only to reach back into community, but to understand that Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks, especially youth, as the most vulnerable and targeted people in this country and globally, should be leading the movement. I think it's important to also acknowledge that people that are in extremely privileged and unique places like I am and like my peers are on this panel in some respect should not also be leading the movement just by ourselves. I think everybody has uh, a role in the movement and based on your skills, your interests, and where you feel you will be the most impactful, that's where, that's where your work begins. I don't think everybody needs to be on the front lines. I don't think there always needs to, have, we don't always need to be boots on the ground for us to feel like we're contributing. I think there is a multitude of, of uh, strategies that can be employed. And like on this panel, we have community engagement, we have international legal advocacy, we have data analytics. If we all just stuck to one, one strategy, it wouldn't work and we would continue to be out strategized by our oppressors. So I think sustainability means being well rounded, acknowledging what your, what your strengths are, what you can contribute, focusing on that and making sure that you know that you're just one part of a movement that has been happening for centuries for multiple generations and your your role is to make sure that it's better for the next generation i'd actually like to jump off of that great transition raven um to consider not only just your strengths but your positionality so again going back to the fact that i'm white like i grew up in a very conservative town it wasn't great for human rights to be honest um but Again, kind of like what Paul had mentioned, I had people reaching out to me to ask what can I do and actually being interested in racial justice movement for the very first time. So knowing your positionality as someone within human rights or um, in a more liberal environment and being able to also reach back to different communities that you've been part of and maybe still have those connections to teach them, hey, this is actually a problem and we need to work on it, this is maybe what you can do, or here's more resources to learn about it. You know, I think one of the things I think is very important that we all remember at this time is, um, and, and I chuckle at it, this, since May 25th, the conversation has been Black Lives Matter. We haven't spoken about the need for equity. We haven't spoken about the need for reparation. We haven't spoken about the need for, for equality really we've, we've just been talking about black lives matter we've been talking about stop indiscriminately killing black men women and people um but this the, the, but what is important that people understand and what i've always tried to to push forward in the messaging that i've been able to to produce um in the month since is that inequality doesn't the the george floyd incident brianna taylor the ahmaud Aubrey's, the belly majinga and shakuri abdi's in the united kingdom they manifest, that's the ultimate extreme manifestation of injustice. 
we we all we sit in a policy school we know we have peers and friends who come to the humphrey school to come to the university of minnesota we focus on public health we focus on housing focus on education that's where inequality manifests itself that's when the seeds are rooted and so it's about understanding that like raven said we all have roles we all have positions not everyone's i i can't do anywhere near the great things i've seen sarah do with data and analytics but there's a role for that in this movement there's a role for understanding that black women are disproportionately affected in the healthcare system they suffer a great deal a study that just came out of the university of minnesota this week shows that where black babies are cared for by black doctors they have a longer survival rate they're more likely to be birthed successfully those inequalities need to be sorted out through people with the data skills we're understanding that if you have that data background go and find somewhere where you can use that if you have a, a propensity to organize if your day job requires you to solicit donations align yourself with an organization and say hey i fundraise for my day job can i teach you guys how to fundraise can i equip and educate your organizers your board members on how to fundraise how to successfully reach out to these foundations and say hey we need donations to do this work and so it's about understanding that the 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 outrage and the the work doesn't start when we see a man being murdered for over eight minutes and 46 seconds the outrage starts when we see black girls choosing a white doll over a black doll because the black doll has so many negative connotations Thank you, Paul. Um, going back to what you guys were talking about with your specific skills, I want to open up some space for folks to talk a little bit more about like their experience in human rights and what strategies and skills they use specifically. Um, I know Nikuli specifically works on community wealth building um, and Raven has done a lot of grassroots organizing. So I was wondering if you guys wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Um, yeah, so my, I guess my, my background for the past three years has really been rooted in what community wealth building is um, and how it works in communities specifically for marginalized communities. Uh, thinking about wealth in terms of like food justice, like healthcare, um, wealth in terms of like money or workforce development. So really thinking about what the intersections of that look like in terms of like a human right with, with, with an addition of like a human rights lens. And so I've been using the work I do at Nexus to kind of inform my studies at, um, at Humphrey to add like a, to add an academic lens to that work it's so that I can more deeply understand it and then I can take it back to my organization and like continue doing the work. And so, yeah, I've just been marrying a lot of the work I've been doing at Nexus with the work I've been doing at Humphrey, um, just to learn more as an individual, but also to kind of broaden my, um, I guess, broaden my my learnings um, in, the, in the different areas. So, I think for me, um, and for a lot of indigenous folks, the very premise of our existence is a form of resistance. It's a form of advocacy, of, of movement, of power. Um, so a lot of the human rights work that I've done was never really like considered human rights work. It was just doing what was best for my community, whether it was working on redistribution of land, whether it was uh, fighting for grants, whether it was like front lines advocacy, uh, for environmental rights. I think, I think oftentimes what the most marginalized groups experience and the way that we organize within our communities, those are the strategies that are then extracted and then taken into theory um, within the academic institution and then sold back to us. Um, and I, I think that most of my 
real learning about human rights happened in the field, it, like not even the field, like it happened in the real world. It happened with my community. It happened when we were experiencing oppression, whenever we were continuing a fight that our ancestors have carried on for centuries against a colonial state. Um, so, of course, organizing grassroots advocacy, um, whether that be some mutual aid work or whether that be like in the front lines engaging in protests, um, those have all come as a natural expectation within Indigenous livelihood. Um, However, the human rights program was able to provide me the skills to develop technical language to be able to enter into spaces that require that kind of that kind of language, that kind of presentation. Um, I don't necessarily agree that that is important, um, but I think. I think being able to move in and out of spaces and recognize that power comes within the community and engaging in whatever strategies are most useful to you. And at some point in my life, it was organizing an advocacy. And now, since I'm experiencing a little bit of burnout from the front lines, um, I have kind of transitioned into a research and fact finding capacity where I think I would be better suited at this moment. Um, and also just generally understanding that I can't pour from, from an empty cup and re recognizing whenever burnout is starting to happen or catching it before it happens. Um, and then kind of reassessing where I'm at, regrounding myself and then moving into a different set of work if that's what I need um, has been the most useful for me because I don't I don't think it's I don't think it is necessary for us to continue to push until our breaking point. Um, it's not helpful for the community. It's not helpful for us. It's not helpful for the movement. So just checking in with myself and be, giving myself the grace to switch between different modes or taking a break completely um, has been part of my strategy. How has, so some of you have touched on this already, but how has your advocacy and human rights strategies changed and adapted because of the pandemic? Um, yeah, if I could, you know, as I alluded to before, um, I'm, I'm someone who really likes to be on the front lines. I like to understand, you know, the pulse of things and what people are feeling, the sentiments that are going on, and, and that just couldn't be the case for me in this situation. And so it, it was, there was a, a real adjustment there. I'm also someone who, you know, for the most part, um, I like to stay away from the spotlight. You know, I like to do my work in the background. I like to, you know, just make sure the focus stays on the focus. And so for me, being in a position where I was having, I was being asked continually, what's going on? How, how what's happening? How can we affect change? What's the next steps? It was, it was very weird for me because I didn't, I, I really didn't want the attention to be about Paul Lillabayo. Um, I, I wanted the focus to be about Black liberation and Black freedom and this movement, right? But you have to understand that a lot of times um, the, the, the community needs to be, the community and the populace needs to be educated. And we all have the extreme privilege of, of um, having an education in this. And we all focus on this. You know, this is what we do Monday to Friday. It consumes our weekends. We study this. We read these things. We see these articles every morning, and we have, you know, the the mindset and the the theory background to understand the interworkings. We understand how how you know a um we we can understand how a child detention how the detention of child migrants affects the long term emotional stability of children from that region. We understand how an economic how economic sanctions on a nation lead to migration and then your your arrest of migrants affects that we understand how those things link and having that understanding is what we need to share to the, to, to the people I, I religiously say there's only there's two real ways to invoke change it's invoked by public sentiment and political will well we know that right now in many of the world lead quote unquote world leading nations we don't have the political will so it's up to us to change the public sentiment and so it's about you know taking on roles that we may not have wanted to take on before and like I say, in the midst of the pandemic, we can't be as 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 um, out in public 
or we really shouldn't be. We were forced to, you know, the, the protests that we saw across the world, most people didn't want to have to go to that. Most people didn't want to risk their health marching down, you know, marching down um, Washington DC or marching through the streets of London or marching through the streets of Minneapolis. They would have much rather been at home keeping themselves and their family safe. But when injustice strikes, injustice strikes, and it has to be met. It has to be counteracted and it has to be met. And so we have to adjust ourselves. We have to adjust our tactics because at the end of the day, the violations are going to continue. And unless we're proactive, working against them, that, that won't change. Uh, if I may, yeah, I think there was um, some time during the pandemic where I took some time to just like grieve and figure out like what, the, what was happening in the world because it was, I mean, it's not familiar, right? It was all new. Uh, but once that was done, as we're like trying to move back into like doing work again in whatever way that felt like work or whatever way that felt good to you. We saw some of the organizations around around us like picking up, trying to figure out like how they, how they could support communities. And so at work, we figured out how, like how to change our, our strategies. I think um, traditionally, we always think there's a certain way to like do grants, there's a certain way to like run organizations. But in that moment, we saw that that obviously was not going to work. And so there were different things that changed such as like our granting structures. I think we like put out um, hundred thousand dollars in like emergency grants to small businesses that were really struggling and like got rid of processes that were not even useful in the first place because they were either they would either hold people up or like not allow them to be able to do to uh, run their businesses like grant applications etc or 50 page grant applications like that, that that doesn't work that doesn't work in a pandemic so trying to figure out like how we can change our processes so that they're faster and more accessible to people and also trying to figure out like how we can get money in community that doesn't require people to jump through hoops or doesn't like have age restrictions or doesn't have um, restrictions for people that don't have um, identification so yeah just that and I think a lot of my work during the pandemic has really been focused on um, moving away from traditional practices to include those practices that um, really center the people that are the most marginalized in a way that it hasn't before. And hopefully taking those practices post the pandemic or post whatever 2020 is and really making sure that our the way we run our organizations is more equitable and more accessible for community. So I don't feel like research has changed a whole lot. I think, Nikuli, you did touch on some of the processes that have changed. Like, everything is online now, so we also have to consider, like, is the system that we're working with secure? Can we protect the identification of those we're talking to? Uh, do we have access to these resources online? So I think, depending on what avenue you're taking with your advocacy, like, We've all been affected for sure, but I think research has been in a slightly different way and in some ways also easier. We aren't changing quite as much as like Nexus is, which I'm a little grateful for, I'll admit. Okay, so going back to something that Raven said earlier um, about academic settings and theory and practice. Um, as all current or former students of the Master of Human Rights, which is a collaboration between the College of Liberal Arts and the Humphrey, um, how has it helped inform the way that you do advocacy and what are its limitations? I'd love for you guys to just share some thoughts on what you're thinking in this moment. Um, if I may, um, I think I think it's twofold for me personally, and um, I'll start with this. I have, as I alluded to in the beginning, um, I have a legal background. I have an under I have an undergraduate um, degree in law from the United Kingdom, and um, one thing about the law that um, I, I I struggled with, especially when I think in terms of wanting to begin a human rights career in the law is that the law is so retroactive, it's so responding, you know, 
the, the human rights lawyers don't come into play until the violation has been committed. We don't hear about the cases until the people of the, until the people in South America have been disappeared. We don't hear about the cases until the the until a victim has perished, you know, and I didn't like that. I think um, human rights work is at its best when it's proactive. Human rights work is at its best when you have a right to life and it's protected. Human rights work is at its best when you have a right to adequate housing and you don't have to fight for it. That's where I think human rights work is best. And I think coming to this program and seeing how human rights is done outside of the legal framework, because I always say about lawyers all the time, and it's true across nations, across us, we only know legal things. We don't know anything else outside of the law. So seeing how human rights exist outside of the law and can be proactive um, was so important for me and so helpful. But on the second hand, um, and one of the things that I definitely learned um, in the wake of May 25th and George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor's murder and all of the, the sad, just emotive stories that were coming out of this time is that there's no level of, of education that replaces the raw passion and emotion that you feel when you see a violation. That, that is the fuel. And that's why I, I always implore people who don't do this as their Monday to Friday like we do to say, listen, there's a role for you. Every single one of us from the top to bottom have a role to play in addressing these violations because when we, we saw it, when the world saw George Floyd be suffocated for eight minutes and 46 seconds, everyone was appalled. There was a gut-wrenching reaction. I'm, I'm one of those people who I couldn't sit through the whole video. The body cam footage that came out a few weeks ago, I refused to watch it. I can't read the transcripts because hearing that man cry out for his deceased mother is, is too much for me. That, but the, the emotion that was stirred up should force you into action. I know it forced me into action. It forces me into action every time I think about the fact that the men who killed Breonna Taylor are still earning paychecks. It forces me into action every time I think that Barry, Great and Manchester Council are slowing their feet on getting justice for Shakuri Abdi, the 12-year-old schoolgirl who was, in my mind, murdered last year. It, it forces you into action when I see Black members of parliament in the United Kingdom being stopped in their car because apparently you can't have a car registered in North of England and drive in the South of England, which is absolutely ludicrous. So I say to everyone, the education is great and it's helpful. And I know it's helped me and I know from some of my peers it's helped us. But the most important thing is the emotion that you feel and translating that emotion into quality actionable work. I don't think I can adequately follow you up, Paul, because that was great. Um, but I'm going to put in a plug for education, because when I was in college, I only learned about human rights in my sophomore year. And it was honestly kind of a colonialist viewpoint. Um, we didn't have a lot of resources. I had maybe two professors who had like maybe their little toe dipped into it. So it really wasn't a con comprehensive view of human rights. And even though it definitely sparked my interest in human rights and my passion for it, I didn't know where to go from there. And that's why I'm really grateful to have this degree so I can actually have a little bit more direction. And then I can kind of extend that education to others who are also lost and don't really know what to do and don't know where to put that passion. Yeah, I think I'd follow up on that by just adding um, that one of the important tools with human rights education is learning different ways to apply rights. So focusing on, um, for example, like indigenous land rights. So if you were looking at a body of water that was being uh, being extracted for oil or was going to be affected by the extraction of oil like the Dakota Access Pipeline. Of course you have federal law that protects those bodies of uh, resources. They, there are like tribal law that also protects uh, some aspects of rights for the ancestral land of whoever's tribe it is. But in addition to that, there's also another body of human rights that often isn't applied because 
for some reason, human rights isn't seen as something that is needed in the United States or like a, a tool for legal advocacy. It's more so focused on like civil rights and federal law. Um, so being able to apply human rights, uh, like the right to access to clean water, the right to uh, security of persons, the right to protections of indigenous land, culture, and peoples. There are like treaty bodies, there are uh, universal declarations that we can use to frame advocacy in a way that can not only draw the attention of authorities within our country, but also international authorities, like special repertoires at the United Nations. Um, and I think that being able to tap into the human rights world and recognize like all of these are applicable. It's the same exact work language in the United States. If you're able to connect those two, I think it makes it easier to build a network and build your capacity to make substantial change. And that is one thing I'm very grateful about from uh, this program and, and human rights education generally, even though I, I have some thoughts about <laughs> you know, tuition and accessibility to higher education, the way that um, academia could feel like it's gatekeeping uh, essential human rights information just for people who are paying tuition and can take the GRE and so forth. But nonetheless, um, education comes in the forms that, that are most useful to everybody. And I think this is a really good forum for people to start tapping into some of that education without having to pay anything so okay I think we're getting about ready to turn it over to questions from the audience, unless, do you guys have any other remarks on the last question? Okay, cool. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa um, to bring some of the Q&A questions. And feel free to keep submitting questions too. Thanks everybody. Yeah, so if any of the audience they have any questions or anything, just drop them in the chat. Um, we have about 15 minutes left or so. And um, we'll take that time for questions. So go ahead and do so if you have any. Vanessa, I see a couple questions in the chat box. Are you not seeing them? Mm, I don't think I'm able to see them. But if you or Jolanda can see them, go ahead and read them. I don't know why. It, I um, it looks like the chat is disabled. Um, but I can I can yeah. read off questions. Yeah. I can read off some of the ones. They're in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Sorry, I think I misspoke. Um, let me see, let's start with, um, this question is directed to Paul. Um, how do you think we raise the profile of racial justice issues in the UK and have these conversations within our own context rather than just a US centered one? Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, naturally. Um, I think the first thing we do is um, to people in the United Kingdom, when we talk about this issue is to stop saying the UK is complicit, as if we're tied to the US's crimes and issues on this. No, the, US, the UK is its own perpetrator and needs to be tried for its own crimes in its own right in its own way. And what I think we need to do is we need to hold every single one of our institutions accountable. Um, just maybe two weeks ago, I was blown aback and flabbergasted when I, when I wake up to a news report of the BBC allowing a white reporter to say the N-word on, on live television, on the news. Um, and when they got the rec 
record number of complaints that they or any TV network has ever gotten in the United Kingdom, their email response was, yeah, we thought about it. It was a tough decision. We did it anyway. No apology, no, no remorse, no regret. Just, we thought about it. We felt like it was important. We did it anyway. Don't really care. We're at a point right now in the United Kingdom, which has, this summer has exposed, and I'm so glad it's exposed, where they're not, I say they as the institution and the oppressors are not even pretending to pander to us anymore. Um, at least when I've been growing up, they've been pandering to us. Um, and I'm so grateful to my peers, my friends, my family back home for, for no longer being willing to sit with the status quo. The UK has allowed themselves to, to hide behind a um, class inequality where we have you know, a, a disparity between our, our working class and our middle class and our upper classes, um, which has always masked entrenched racial equalities within the system. Um, we're, not, we're no longer in a position where those are going to be allowed to, to be hidden. I think the way we raise it is by, one, not taking our, our foot off the pedal in what has happened throughout this summer, um, not allowing the government and institutions to mistreat our words. So when a petition goes round and says we want a mandatory racial justice curriculum at all levels of education, not allowing the education secretary to come back and say, we have a, a vast, diverse racial justice optional curriculum. I didn't ask you about an optional curriculum. I said mandatory. Listen to what I'm saying. When we ask our health secretary to say, to acknowledge COVID and the inequalities that black people face in that disease, and then the inequalities that, like I alluded to, black women face in childbirth, in pregnancy, not siphoning that off as, well, you know, it's a small problem. It's a small problem which costs a lot of lives and the lives need to be addressed. And so it's keeping our pressure on and, and making sure that at every level, um, at every level, at every level, and I mean that from the intergovernmental to the interpersonal and the communications that we have with each other on buses, on trains, on, in, on at football matches when they return, at the pubs, which many black people are scared to go to because we don't know what a drunk Saturday night at a pub in somewhere in the UK is going to look like for us, making sure that we're addressing these things, standing up and protecting one another. Cool. Thank you, Paul, for answering. Answering that. Um, I think we have a couple of good ones to end with. So how, and anyone can answer this, how do you all have conversations with people that do not agree with what you're advocating for or may just not be informed about it? How do you go about having those conversations or not? So I think, <laughs> I think I'll start with this question. Um, I think there's a very distinct line to be drawn um, with not only intention, but impact. So we all have access to the internet um, in some way, shape or form. We all can have access to uh, user generated content on Twitter from activists who are doing the work on the ground. We have access to free academic articles. We can have conversations in community. Um, I think Part of, part of the responsibility before you enter into any of these conversations is doing the work yourself, doing the work first, and then coming to community, uh, asking people if they have the capacity or desire to have these conversations with you, and then letting the conversation happen as a means of learning and listening and not necessarily arguing or debating. I think a line has to be drawn. Um, when you're when somebody is willing to have a conversation with you like what is the intention of the conversation what are they hoping to get out of it if it's just like an argument because somehow people are invigorated by that then like you can choose for yourself if that's meaningful but i've started to draw hard boundaries for myself that if people aren't willing to do the work beforehand before they're coming into conversation with me then i simply will say sorry, not a conversation I have at, at this time, I have the capacity to have at this time. 
and here's a ton of resources that you can go and read or look at and then we can revisit it. But if it's just like a genuine question because people in my family don't have the same education that I do and have different skill sets, I'm willing to have that conversation because there's a willingness to be open to listening, learning and unlearning. And if that capacity isn't there in any conversation that I have, it, I just disengage at this point. One more thing, it's not people's responsibility to educate you either. Like that's your work. Yeah, I agree with everything Raven said, um, definitely. Um, Google is free. Um, if you want, if you, I think a lot of times people come, especially to BIPOC people asking for this and want to be educated, if it is in that way, if it's like a white person coming to a BIPOC person, then pay them for their time and their expertise. Um, yeah, that's all I have to add because I think at this point, um, I'm tired. I don't have the energy. I don't have the mental capacity to do this. I will refer you to my white friends, my white allies who are in this fight with me to help you through that. But we can have this conversation once you have done your own learning, just like Raven said, yes. And pay people to do the work if that's what you want. Thank you everyone for your questions. We're sorting through here really quickly. There's a lot of questions. Thanks so much for everyone being so engaged. Um, I think we probably have time for like one more question, maybe two. If you want me to take up one or two minutes while you guys are looking through, I can comment also as like a white person in the room. <laughs> uh, I think also like even if you are a white ally, I've encountered people who are like what Raven has said and they just want to fight and you need to figure out who those people are early on because it's not worth your own mental health to fight with them when all they want to do is tear you down. And I've learned that the hard way and I'm still working on it and I think it's just a lifelong process. But I think again as a white person like as an ally, you can take on some of that education work. Um, like Nikuli had mentioned, she refers people to the white allies that she knows. And I think it's in some ways easier to relate to someone who's gone through that education work yourself to relate to someone who's also like very lost and you can give them a little bit more of a boost and take off that pressure from uh, by POC people who are unfortunately so overwhelmed with everything that's going on and then the well-meaning white people who are just not really reading the room and still going to their black friends or their indigenous friends and asking like how can I help and it's like you are actually adding to the problem so I think being aware of that is really important. So we've gotten a few questions from incoming first year Masters of Human Rights students about how they can be involved um, as they join, some of them moving to Minneapolis and joining the Twin Cities community, um, others who have already been involved locally, but um, do you guys have any advice about how they can set themselves up for success in their education and getting involved in organizations um, like the work that you're doing? Um, I can go. When I first moved here three years ago, one of the first things I did was I set up one-on-ones with, uh, I looked up different organizations around the Twin Cities to see what they were doing, saw some work that aligned with my values and my passions, and set up some one-on-ones with some people. Um, there are also some really great programs here um, in, in the Twin Cities that have to do with like leadership development, um, either BIPOC specific or non-BIPOC specific, where you can really like build communi community like outside of Humphrey, which can also inform your Humphrey work. 
Um, yeah, and I know that it's really important once you, if you are here, um, or you could also do this virtually, like connecting with uh, the professors here at the U. I've had some really great experiences with um, Dr. Uh, Barbara, Wal Bob, Bob, Barbara Fry, uh, Barb and Janet and Amelia and, uh, and, a, and a, uh, there are other people also at Humphrey that are great resources. Um, if you just want to like talk to them, uh, set up some time. Um, most people that I spend uh, ask for one-on-ones are open to that and are more than willing to offer some words of wisdom. Um, and I think another thing, I think I saw something about wellness, so I'll just add this, making sure that you take care of yourself in whatever way that looks like, whether it's going to the gym, going for a walk, going to therapy, those all like really help um, help you when you're in grad school or whatever you're doing in life, help you settle in, just making sure that you're taking care of yourself while doing that, that I find that helps with my success at school or at work, when I really center my wellness as well. Um, if I can just interject quickly, I think um, I want to like just follow on some of what Nkudu said, and I think this will also address another question I saw in the Q&A, asking about how um, local engagement informs um, global activism. I think um, what I did the complete opposite of what Nkudu said she did. I came to the Minneapolis and I was so wide-eyed, I'm going to work at the UN, it's going to be the ICC, it's going to be all these international organizations, and I didn't realize about the great human rights community and network that existed within the Twin Cities until these past few months where I've seen all these organizations be so prominent and be so active and, and, and be so at the forefront of all these things. And I was very disappointed in myself because that that's where activism starts. That's where it works. And the like I said, the, the international organizations are great and they do great work and they're very important to the system. But the, the international human rights framework that we have doesn't exist and doesn't work in the right way without the grassroots, without the local level. And I would say, um, do, I would say don't do like I did, but do what Nkuli did, reach out to these organizations, find out who they are, find out what they are and see if you have anything, see if, there, see if there's roles that you can play, see if there's ways that you can be a part of them, even if it's just donations, even if it's just signing their petition, maybe they don't need hands-on help from people, but staying engaged in what they're talking about, staying engaged in their community center, same, same engaged in our conversations, going to those town halls, because one thing that you're able to do more at the local level than you do at the international level, from my experience, is impact individuals' lives. And the impact that you see in an individual's life when you can go to a, a, go to a, a shelter and help someone find resources to, to healthcare, help someone find resources to, to clothing while they're in a shelter, that, that benefit in that person's life is just as important as any policy that you'll get put in place at a domestic or national level. Thank you, Paul. So we've had so many questions come in. Thank you so much. Um, we hope that we can connect with you guys outside of the panel if we don't get to your question. We just heard from Keith, the organizer, that we can keep going for another 10 minutes if we um, want to keep the conversation going for a little bit. No pressure if folks need to get going um, or need to log off at any point. Um, so given that, I think we're going to take a couple more. Does anyone else have any comments about, to the first years before I, we ask another question? Just like one more thing. Um, although Facebook is awful as a platform, um, it has been used in a lot of organizing. So COVID has created this like push for us to get into a digital space where advocacy is primarily done um, through online platforms. So I would say join in on uh, mutual aid groups, on organizing groups. Um, there are different political organizations that also have Facebook groups and they're constantly being updated with calls for action um, and you could build community through those groups as well so just try to utilize social media in the best way that you can and um, just make sure to follow follow along with local activists, local content creators that are focused on things that are within your interest within um, advocacy and human rights.
Okay, cool. So we have time for a couple, like a few more questions, I think. Um, I think this question um, is important, especially now. Um, so for those of you that have Vanessa, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so this question, um, for those of you that have graduated or even if you've not graduated yet, I think you can still answer this. Um, where do you think your degree will take you um, post-grad for your first job or just in career-wise? Okay, somebody can step in. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking a lot right now, but so I am currently doing contractual work with the International Secretariat of Amnesty International on a corporate crimes project. Um, so there is a possibility to get connected with um, these larger international human rights organizations if, if that's something you're interested in. Um, and I also think that it's important to think about human rights outside of the perspective of just like the field within itself. Like it's not just the UN, it's not just Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International or even local organizations. There's, way that you, there's ways that you can do human rights work even in government. At least the state of Minnesota has a human rights department. Um, different, different nonprofit organizations also have a human rights um, and legal advocacy branch. And um, as controversial as it is, even corporations have human rights compliance um, and business and human rights standards. So there are a lot of jobs that you could kind of switch into um, that can be referred to in a bunch of different terms like legal advocacy and community engagement, stakeholder engagement. All of these are like code words for human rights as well. So. I am going to be transitioning from my uh, international secretariat work to um, leading a human rights initiative for a global sourcing team at a corporation. Um, and yeah, I think if I didn't know that before, that there were all these different avenues that you could go through, then I probably wouldn't have gotten this opportunity, but there's a range, consulting, corporate corporate America, government, and nonprofit world, there's like a ton of opportunities. I think I can back that up through my job application process. Um, unfortunately, has been unsuccessful so far, but yeah, like I have applied to consulting agencies. I used to work for government, kind of want to move away from that for a while at least. Um, but yeah, like nonprofits, legal organizations, I feel like there's really no limit to where you can apply human rights, which is very odd considering like I went into this program thinking similar to Paul, like, oh, I'm going to end up working for like Human Rights Watch or some other big organization and then finding out oh, CBT is like a quarter mile away from where I live and they do awesome work. Okay, I think with that, we're going to start closing up. Um, thank you again so much for everyone's engagement and questions. Um, this has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you guys. Thank you to the panelists. Um, Nikuli had to leave for another meeting, so thanks to Nikuli as well. Um, so as we close up, I'm going to turn it over to Keith to close up the series for the summer. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I thought this was amazing. And I know that I, I don't think there's a better way that we could have ended the series than with a panel focused on students. Um, and I appreciate how um, honest and, and just really, it, I learned a lot. So I really appreciate your time. I think it was great. 
Um, as they mentioned, this is the final um, seminar of the Humphrey Seminar Series. So thank you to everybody who tuned in every Thursday at noon and shared your lunch with us. Um, we will look to do something like this again in the future. Uh, but for right now, um, stay safe and uh, be healthy. And thank you all for your time. Have a good afternoon.